I think it's lesson two in Matthew, uh, second semester of Matthew. And we're looking at prayer. You've already had this occurring here. I'm just uh, reminding you here. Um, let the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And, and I really can't emphasize enough the importance of prayer and uh, how the Bible tells us how we are to pray, uh, the guidelines for prayer. Um, we didn't start this in the right place, yeah. Oh, we had that one. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is where we start now. Oh, that's the new one, right? Yeah, this is the new one. Okay. Uh, I mean, even Jesus prayed uh, as an example to us the importance of prayer. But like I say, just because a person's saved doesn't mean they're able to pray. And I don't really think most people understand that. Uh, I don't think most churches understand it. I don't, I don't even think that most pastors understand it. Uh, because if they did, they would emphasize uh, the practice of prayer more and how to pray and teach the congregation how to pray. Uh, and, and most churches don't do that. They just simply, you know, somebody gets saved and they send them home with the Bible and tell them, read the Bible and pray now every day and, and God will bless you. And so they go home, uh, starting in Genesis 1 1. I mean, we're, you know, any book you start at the beginning. Uh, and then by the time they get to, you know, Genesis, Exodus is fine. By the time we get to Leviticus, they're so confused because they, you know, how am I, am I supposed to do these sacrifices? You know, I mean, uh, they're completely ignorant uh, of the scriptures. And remember, the word ignorant doesn't mean stupid; it just means without knowledge. They just don't know. And God doesn't supernaturally give us wisdom to understand everything all at once. If He did, we wouldn't be here. We already understand everything. Uh, but He gives us that understanding as we participate in that study. If we don't uh, strive to learn, then God's not going to give us the understanding of it. Uh, and so, people do need to understand the importance of prayer. Um, last week, we talked about the Pharisees standing out and praying. And remember, uh, public prayer is not wrong. Uh, I think we might have did have this last week, didn't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, I might, might have said it. I might have had it Thursday night and not the oh, Monday. Okay. Uh, I know you said did. something we about did. public prayer. Yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. We did. Yeah. okay, we did. And we thought that if this is the main idea of praying in okay. secret. Okay. Sure did, because I got a note right here, Matthew right, 6 go. 6. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, yeah. but important, very importantly, prayer is talking what? To God. With God. With, with God. God. With God. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I know we all, we've been saying to God all the time. <laughs> and I know people, you know, don't make a big deal out of that. But in my mind, I want to make sure that when I pray, I use the word with because to remind me that, you know, I'm, I'm communicating God, but God wants to communicate to me. Mm -hmm. And like I say, he doesn't do it with an audible voice, but he does do it through, through his word. You know, uh, 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 speaking to us through a passage, you're going through a tough time, and you're having emotions, and a verse comes up, and you say, well, praise the Lord, that's exactly what I needed. And it's because God directs that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the pastors and new preachers, whenever they study, uh, if, uh, next week I'm preaching at a church up in Pinnacle. And so I pray right now, Lord, what is it you want me to preach? You know, what passage? Uh, and that's the hardest part of a sermon, is decide what God wants me to preach. Mm -hmm. And then once I realize what it is, then you know, as I study the passage, then I gain the understanding from it. But the importance of praying and, uh, uh, is, is talking with God. Mm -hmm. Historical background of John 1, 48, and I know we're in Matthew, but uh, Matthew 21, 19 said, we saw a fig tree in the way. He came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Now, why did Jesus condemn the fig tree? Uh, he found nothing on it, but leaves. Yeah, so, what was wrong with that? And obviously, it's not the fig tree that matters right here, but why he did it. Now, in order to understand this passage, we really need to look at the, at the history of the fig tree and the history of Israel. In, in regards to the fig tree. Nathaniel, 
in uh, John 1 point, said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? He's talking to Jesus, and when he approached Jesus, Jesus knew who he was. And Nathaniel said, well, how, how do you know me? You know, Jesus answered, said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So, why was he under a fig tree? What, what does that matter? Well, the tradition, and this is not found in the Bible, so you, know, you can't uh, back it up by scriptures as such, but the tradition of the Jews was in those days to go out, and of course, and remember last week we talked about the, pub, uh, uh, the uh, Pharisees praying in public. Uh, they like to do it so people can see them. And the fig tree had become a place basically of, we would say Bible devotions, or, or their okay. the prayer time. So they go out to underneath the fig tree, and that's where they would pray. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, in and of itself. Right? Uh, however, when it becomes a tradition, uh, when it becomes a place uh, that you go to to be seen of men, then there's the problem. And so Israelites would typically rest under fig trees for, for prayer. And so Jesus then condemns in Matthew 21, 19, the fig tree. And I believe he did because the tree became representative of the worthless prayer life. It became a place where people were to be seen rather than to be with God. And again, it's not, it was not anything wrong with them going to the fig tree at first. Y'all saw the movie, The Prayer Room, uh, War Room, rather. Uh, uh, and that's, I think, you, uh, Sandra even has her own little war room at home. Yeah, I do. Uh, and that's good, I think. Uh, is it necessary? No, not in and of itself, it's not. But is it important? Well, I think it is somewhat. I, I really do. Uh, I think it's important that we have a place that we can go and pray and, and be alone with God. Now, that... Closet, is it a closet or a bedroom or something? Closet and a bedroom. Okay. Uh, in and of itself, it's just a room. There's nothing holy about that room. And there's nothing more special about that room. Uh, it's just a room. That's all it is. But it's what's done in that room that is holy. And so, uh, like I say, anybody else walking in that room, they're not going to get it. You know, because it's, it's not like you can become holy because you're now on holy ground. Right. Uh, the, the room is, it has nothing to do with it. Uh, the cloth has nothing to do with it. It's the, what happens in that room that's important here. And maybe at the beginning, the fig tree here was a good place. <coughs> maybe somebody, you know, out on a journey and they, you know, uh, uh, were resting under a fig tree one day and they started praying and, uh, there and being with, alone with God, that would be a great thing. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, unless you make the, the, the place more important than the event. Believe it or not, <laughs> y'all are going to laugh, but when I get up in the morning, we have two bathrooms, and I use the one that's connected to our room, but you got two doors. Mm -hmm. When I go in the restroom in the morning, that's where I say my prayer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's yeah. Uh, it's good to have a place. Place, yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll go on here to the next screen, and we'll we'll talk about that okay. next place here. The prayer closet. Okay. This is a place I used to go uh, for my prayer time, and so. Uh, I went there for two or three years, maybe. Uh, and I, there was a bench, a certain bench I'd go to, and that's where I would spend my time with God praying. Uh, and, and that's an actual place that... Yeah, yeah okay. this is the girl hall. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, oh, that's really a place. Yeah, yeah that's really a place. I went to, yeah. yeah, that's what it's... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a park and girl hall. Oh, that's a like that. beautiful. Yeah. Sure is. Um, I think it's important to set aside a place to pray. I do too. You know, so yeah. whether it's a bathroom, whether it's your closet, mm -hmm. uh, what have you, it, it's good to have a certain place to go and pray. And I think that place should be a special place. Now, 
to you. It, and this is all in your mind because it doesn't make any difference what other people think. Uh, but it's all for you. It's fine. Whatever place it is that you designate. I say whether it's the bathroom, whether it's the closet, whether it's the basement, whether it's the woods out behind your house, uh, whether it's a park you go to uh, at certain times to pray. There's a place that to you, when you get there, you you know why you're there. You're only there for one purpose, and that's to spend time with God. You know, I don't go to that, never went to that park for recreation. I didn't go to that park for anything else. I just went, went there to be alone with, with the Lord. And so that made it a special place to me. Uh, a place where you can avoid distractions. I don't think you can sit in your living room with the TV on and uh, your family sitting there watching TV and you sit in the corner and read your Bible and pray. Uh, it, it just can't do that. And the uh, telephone rings. Yes. Yeah. I can't stand yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, it's got to be a place without any distractions. Because, you know, it's, it's easy to be distracted. Uh, you know, the Bible says nothing about praying with our eyes closed. But we do it. Why? Oh, or distraction. I guess I, I guess what before I pray, I try to visualize praying actually to God and kneeling down before His throne. So I try to put the throne, uh, what I think the throne looks like, right. in my a, mind. A, 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 a visual or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've done that. Yeah, and that uh, makes me stay focused, I think, a yeah. little bit more. Uh, for, you know, when I <coughs> preach, I always think uh, of the image of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually it's an image of him standing there, you know, in the robe, his hands are down, whatever, basically welcome. But I, before I, I preach, I always like to think of that image on the back wall of the church. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, when I'm preaching, I'm aware that God is watching me. And what I preach then must be from the Word of God, not just be my opinion. You know, because I, and the reality of it is, while I can't see, really see him back there, he is there. Mm -hmm. And so we ought, we ought to do that. But we pray with our eyes closed simply to, uh, for, uh, uh, so we won't be distracted. Uh, I mean, if you're, out, you're looking around while you're praying, you know, it's many times, you know, I've been praying if something's driving down the road, and I'm praying, then something distracts me from it, and I forget I was even praying, to be honest with you. Uh, it's, it's so easy for us to do. So, like I say, set aside a certain place, make it a very special place, place to avoid distractions, and don't rely upon the place for spirituality. Don't think because you're in your prayer closet that automatically makes you holy. Because it doesn't. Uh, you need to be holy before you get in there. And to, to confess, to make sure your relationship with God is what it ought to be. We should daily evaluate our lives. Uh, evaluate our relationships with others to make sure that we are right with God. Uh, I believe it's Matthew when it talks about uh, when you go to the altar, uh, make sure your heart's right with God. If not, uh, you can't remember exactly how it's worded now. Um, but basically go back and think makes things right uh, before you get to the altar. When I'm praying with God, Dr. K, I try to always, always, Ask him to, first of all, to please forgive me of my sins. Yeah. Because it's heavy on my heart. Well, we ought to do that and ask God to reveal to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, sin. Because sometimes we do things, we don't even think them as that, sin. That's right. I mean, some you know, the, the, the normal ones people think of sin. Yeah, we get that. But maybe it's uh, a, a misspoken word we said to someone. You know, we didn't think anything about it. But to them, it really bothered. And so, you know, make sure that, you know, what we say, it, that we don't offend people unnecessarily. Uh, we, we say the right things we can. If we, we may have to apologize to someone, you know. Uh, I apologize to people I didn't do anything to, but they thought I did. And so I apologized for it because I thought, well, that, you know, if, if you think I did, then that's real to you. And so I'm very sorry. You know, in my heart, I didn't mean anything bad or anything wrong, but they thought it wrong. Hey. I'm not going to get mad and say, well, I'm not apologizing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not fellowship with God. <laughs> so we make sure. That I heard Charles Stanley say, I think it was yesterday, he said that 
we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and when we pray, the Holy Spirit is not going to, we may be praying a myth, we may be praying for stuff that God don't want to hear. And he said that he would take, the Holy Spirit would take that, and he would take out of what God wants to hear. Filter. Yeah, it's like filter. And, yeah. and, and he would only tell God what God wants to hear from us. Yeah. I get what he's saying. Yeah. Sense, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it made me feel good because yeah. I was like, how many times have I played in this? Well, you know, <clears throat> the thing about it is, it's not the words that really matter. The it's heart. the attitude of the heart. Mm -hmm. Because God knows the attitude of the heart. We can misspeak, and God's not going to say, you didn't say the right word. Mm -hmm. You know, no. Uh, God knows the heart. So, yeah, when we say things, we might say things wrong, but God does know the heart. And so that's what it is very, very important to us. And again, you're to be holy, not your prayer possible. So, uh, so wherever it is that you pray at. Uh, and it, like I say, it doesn't have to be the same place every time. Uh, however, you know, to me, the living room would never be the place because it's a place for recreation, it's a place for other things. Uh, I mean, if you, I, I, I'm not saying you can't be, use your living room, obviously, for you, you could. For me, no, it's not a prep place for me. Uh, I can't be around other people when I do it. Uh, wherever it might be. Uh, like I say, out in the woods, it's fine. Uh, I've known some preachers that had places in the woods they would go, one of them used to talk about a big rock that he would go to out in the woods, at, I guess behind his house or somewhere, but that's a very, just a very special place he'd go, and that's where he would spend time with the Lord. So, so the importance of having a place to pray. And when we pray, Matthew 6 says to avoid vain repetition. Remember the word vain means empty or uh, insincere, yeah. useless, really, when it comes down to it. Just repeat the same words that we've said before without any thought to it. Uh, so I, I don't think you should teach kids now that lay me down to sleep. Uh, So-called prayer, a lot of parents do. A lot of parents teach their kids uh, to pray a certain prayer when they eat. You know, uh, God's great and God's good. Uh, now we think for his food kind of thing. And in and of itself, that's not wrong for a very small child, but as the child gets any uh, ability to think for themselves, they ought to be taught how to pray. Uh, praying for our, our meals, I mean, the qualification for praying for our meals is 1 Timothy 4.4. Uh, nothing be received unless it's received with thanksgiving. Uh, so, honestly, your prayer before you eat could be thanks. Right? That it's all it has to be. Uh, I know we feel like we have to say more. Uh, and that's, I'm not saying you can't say more, but remember, it's, we're just thanking God for the food. Uh, not trying to talk to other people when we do it. And I've seen a lot of people do that. They go to restaurants, they want to make sure that everybody hears them pray. Uh, and that's nothing but a Pharisee. And you know, someone to, to be heard. Now, saying that, vain repetitions, can we pray the same prayer over and over? And the answer to that, of course it is, we can. Uh, but with thought put into that. Uh, I mean, Jesus himself, in a garden of Gethsemane, said, then come Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and said unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then after he prayed, he comes to his disciples and finds them asleep. And said unto Peter, what, did you not watch with me one hour? Yeah, I told you to wait here, but you fell asleep. 
So again, he said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thou will be done. So he basically went and prayed the exact same prayer again. Uh, why did he pray this prayer? Because he was about to die. Uh, did he want to die? The flesh didn't. You know, because the flesh, his flesh was like our flesh. Uh, we don't want to die. I mean, how many of you believe you're going to heaven? Yeah. How many of you love to go to heaven now? Yeah. But, but we, we do if it's a rapture. Yeah. But if I go in my office with it and bring back a shotgun, then you'll say, I think I'll wait till. <laughs> Oh, wait a while. Yeah. We don't want to get on that bus right now. Uh, and so, cumulatively speaking, could Jesus handle death? Yes. Did he know he could? Yes, because he's God. But the suffering part of that. And remember, he's doing things for our example. He's not doing things because he had to do these things. He's doing things to be an example to us. And so we see again that, that he did pray the same prayer twice. Paul uh, repeated his request in his thorn in the flesh lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I sought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Now we know what God told him. Uh, no. You know, uh, my grace is sufficient. You, I'm not going to answer that prayer. We don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. If I were to guess, I would say the thorn in the flesh was a person. Uh, and I say that based upon the, the whole passage, uh, because the thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what else is a messenger of Satan? I mean, is, is a, a sickness, a bad eyesight, a messenger of Satan? Mm -hmm. you, you don't wear glasses. I do content. Oh, do So, mm -hmm. messenger of Satan got y'all. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, <laughs> But the fact is, no, I, I don't think that's a bad eyesight, and I don't know why people want to say that. I've heard preachers so dogmatic about that, that if you don't agree with them, that you're just of the devil. Uh, I think, I'm going to say it's Mitch Satan, I think it's a person. And then also, the Apostle Paul knew the, the Bible, he knew the Old Testament. He was a student of the Old Testament even before he got saved. And in Judges 2 3, and Numbers 33, 55, both use the phrase that they, they thorn in the side or thorn in the flesh. And both times they were referring to people. So I think somebody, whoever it was, and again, I, I can't be 100% and say absolutely if you don't agree with me, then you don't believe the Bible. Because, uh, but from the context of it, I, I, I really do believe that it was a person. Uh, but the point of it is, God said no even though he kept praying for it. And in Paul's mind, this is something very important to him that he wanted removed. And God still said, no, my grace is sufficient. So in our prayer life, we might be praying about something that we really think we truly need or something we really want, uh, but more importantly, something we think we, tr we truly need, and God says, no. You, you think you need it, but my grace is sufficient. I, I will get you through this. Uh, somehow, in his way, not in our way. Uh, so again, now, saying that, it's, it is important that we pray, sometimes pray, for. you might be praying about something for years. You know, it may be months, it might be weeks, maybe years that you pray about it. You may have something you've been praying about for, for 15 years or 20 years. I don't know. Uh, and that's fine, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we do, we keep asking, keep asking. Remember, Luke 11, 8 talks about, use the word importunity. And it's talking about the man knocking on the door. And he kept knocking. And importunity means persistent. So he kept asking, kept asking, kept asking. Nobody answered, so he kept knocking, knocking, knocking. Nobody answered. He didn't quit, he kept knocking. And then finally, the, the man came up. That is true with when we're asking God for something. However, confession of sins does not require us to repeat our confession. Right? When we pray and ask God for forgiveness, we only have to do it one time. That's it. How do I know that? Because 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So when I confess my sin, whatever it might have been, and if I feel really bad about it, and I have done that, and I, you know, may have done it to confess to sin, but you, you know it was wrong, and so later on you, you pray and ask God to forgive you again. Uh, if God can answer us in an audible voice, it might be, we might be praying, saying, Lord, I, forgive me in that sin, and he says, I forgive you. Uh, next day we feel bad about it, and we go back to God and say, Lord, I ask that you forgive me for that, and he, he would say, what sin are you talking about? Yeah, I don't remember them anymore. They're gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far has removed our transgressions from us. And Micah says that he buries them in the depths of the sea and puts up a no fishing sign. Well, <laughs> might not say that last part, but the, the point is there. He doesn't recall them back to us. And so the great thing about uh, forgiveness is that if we're sincere, now I'm not saying, now if you're insincere, then you haven't confessed your sin. You haven't really asked God to forgive you. Uh, some people will say things, you know, Lord, forgive me for this, but I'm going to keep doing it. Well, then you've never, you haven't confessed your sin. And so now you have sin in your life, you can't pray until you confess that sin, remember. So it is important that we understand that asking for God may take a thousand times, or less or more. Asking for forgiveness, <laughs> that's pretty amazing when you think about it. That God will forgive me. All I have to do is ask. And I know that I'm forgiven. I know He's faithful and He's just. God's justice is served when He forgives my sin. I'm thinking, that ain't fair. It's not fair. It's not fair to God. I mean, you know, because I deserve punishment. I deserve chastening. I deserve all the bad things to happen. And God immediately says, You're forgiven. <clears throat> Praise God for that. Matthew 6 talks about after this manner in our prayer life. So, after this manner means this is a pattern for praying. It's not a prayer that we pray. Because to pray this prayer would be vain repetition. I know a lot of people have devotional books that have prayers in them. Uh, and I've even had people uh, show me prayers. They go, oh, I found this prayer the other day. Yeah, I pray this prayer. And that's not scriptural. Uh, because when you pray, it just, you know, you notice on the videos here, from the class I make, uh, I never record the prayer. In, in the videos. Uh, why? Because to read them off to somebody watching at home, my prayer, that's not me praying anymore. My prayer only happened in this class. It doesn't happen by video. And every time that video is played, that's me praying and praying and praying. And no. Because it, it, it only happens when I'm talking with God at the time that I say it. So I never, ever record prayers. Uh, I don't read other prayers. Uh, some denominations, um, the uh, Episcopal Church uh, and the Church of England, which is the same thing, Anglican Church, Church of England, Episcopal in this country, uh, have a book of common prayer. And so, uh, I, I think I have one somewhere. Uh, you open it up and whatever you're going through, you can find a prayer that will cover that issue. And so you pray that prayer. You read that prayer to God. Well, that's a your petition. Now, now uh, there are some good books out there that will tell you, you know, if you're lonely, these are some verses that you can read that will help you with that. that and I'm all for that, you know, all the way. But prayer, no. Uh, when you, if you have a devotional book and it has prayer in there, you don't pray that prayer. You pray your own prayer. Uh, I, just, I think it's, it, it's so important that we understand it. It's us talking with God. It's not just reading something and then God has to do it because we're at it. I mean, that's a magic book or something. It's, a, it's not our relationship with God. The pattern of proper prayer really comes down to its simplicity. I know, you know, looking back at my prayer life over the years, uh, for times I would pray and pray and pray, and God wouldn't answer the prayer. So, I reworded my prayers. 
thinking that, well, if I said it differently, then God would answer it. Uh, God's not stupid. You know? uh, I was. I was being stupid, thinking that, okay, if I, if I say it this way, you know, like if I can find the exact formula, then God's going to give me what I want. And that, of course, is totally ridiculous. Uh, prayer is simple. And there are times when you pray that you won't say anything. Uh, there's been times in my life when I went to pray. I can remember going to the altar or something, maybe at church or maybe at home, whatever it might be, but going to God and getting up there and thinking, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know how to pray. And God would say, I know, you don't. And so the Holy Spirit prays. And Jesus prays for us with intercessions. It says in Romans chapter 8, Holy Spirit with groans which cannot be uttered. I mean, he, he, we don't know what to say, but he does. And so he knows our heart. Um, and I think it's best that we understand that we don't know how to pray most often. Because we know what the need is, but we don't know what to, what to say to God. And God understands those prayers. So it's not a, a magical formula. It's not the way you word it. And like I say, it's not even words sometimes. It's the attitude of the heart. Here, Matthew talks about, he said, Be not therefore like unto them, talking about the Pharisees, for your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. So the word therefore is talking about, okay, don't pray like the publicans. Don't pray to be seen. You don't pray out in public so people notice you. You pray, you're talking with God. If, if you're, you can pray in public. There's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, Jesus prayed in public. Uh, others prayed in public in the Bible. So there's nothing wrong with praying in public. But when it comes down to it, it's just you talking with God, and that's it. And if I pray in public, I'm not talking to the congregation. When I pray in the class, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. And praying in church, what have you. So this prayer here is an illustration. And it's in contrast to the many words. Remember, he said, you know, they pray with all kinds of words and all that. And so he tells us here, uh, don't be like unto them. You don't have to use a thousand words if all it takes is three. You know, do we think the more talking that we have to convince God? I know we tend to do that sometimes. We tend to think that we have to keep praying. I remember that guy preached in our church one time, and there was a lot of other things wrong with what he said, but uh, he talked about, he said, his prayer, pray. He said, I was up all night, all night long praying. Praying, 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 praying. He said, I just had to, I kept talking to God, begging God, and just stayed up all night long. A little bit later, he talked about that he went to bed like 12 o'clock. And I'm thinking, first of all, it's not all night long. <laughs> I mean, that might be late for someone, uh, but the fact is, why do you need to pray for eight hours? I'm not saying you can't. I mean, if you're really talking with God over something, but the fact is, God knows the heart. And if we're just praying for eight hours and repeating the same prayer over and over again, we're really not, that's not what we're to do. And so it is important that we think about what we pray. If you pray, it lasts four hours, it's, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if you just repeat yourself over and over again so you can put in the time, so you can say, well, I prayed longer than you did. Nah, nah, nah. Well, that's just ridiculous. I think what I did was I gave them one hour from Jesus. And he said, can you know what to watch with me for one hour? And that's well, why I'm thinking, I'm supposed to pray for an hour. And it's uh, hard to pray for an hour. Well, it is. It is because I say you just repeat yourself. Uh, but, but he doesn't it. require, and that has when we talk about watching for one hour. He's, he's not really saying you have to uh, uh, pray for, for one hour. Because I was thinking, we're supposed to be in there for an hour. No. <laughs> it, it depends when you do. Maybe times you're there more, maybe times less. I mean, uh, the fact is, if you're, like I say, you're not rushing to get through, you know, if you go have your devotions and it's uh, 10 o'clock and you've got to be somewhere at 11 o'clock. And so you got to hurry up with these. It was worthless. Yeah. Because you're putting your event up 
before your prayer time. So that's why you schedule your time to pray because you know we there's prayers, there's intercessory prayers uh, um, uh, that we pray. Uh, prayers is our scheduled time of prayer. Intercessory is when we pray driving down the road or you know somebody says pray for me and you stop and pray kind of thing. Uh, but your scheduled prayer, God doesn't put a time limit on it. Uh, like I say, it does come down to the attitude of the heart. If you're doing it to, uh, because you feel like you have to do exactly 60 minutes, then that's not really right. Okay. Uh, if you're doing it and say, i got to be somewhere, so I have to stop at 11.30, whatever. That's not really right. It's the time you spend with God that you, you know, pray, and you're reading your Bible, and you're going through your prayer list, or whatever it might be that you're doing in that scheduled time. However you do it, it's fine. But God doesn't put a time limit on it. Of course, uh, so nothing wrong with praying for an hour, but uh, if you just repeat yourself over and over again, God knows, God heard you the first time. Proper prayer. Uh, well, like I say, we'll go ahead and start with this next week. Uh, the importance of proper prayer.